All right, we're going to open with the uh, community comments. There are non agendized items only. Uh, keep it to two minutes or under. And uh, remember decorum, no uh, personal attacks, insults, etc. Well, I so, yeah. <laughs> so, is there any, uh, any community comments? And also identify yourself as you will. Uh, do I see from here? Do I go? You, uh, how would you come? All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Taylor, and this is my girlfriend, Christy. And uh, just recently in December, we bought a house off of Bootlegger and Zoltan. Uh, so we're new to the community, and we wanted to come out and introduce ourselves. And uh, we're currently in the process of remodeling our home, but it was built in the 80s without permits. And we're working with the county uh, department of regional planning to do a conditional use permit. Uh, so that we can rehab it and retrofit it, bring it up to code and all that good stuff. Uh, with that being said, the Department of Regional Planning wanted us to come out, uh, let Acton Town Council know uh, that this project is going on, uh, on Hefner specifically, off of Bootlegger. And uh, that's about it, I guess, if anybody has any questions. Um, I have a few, a minute maybe left. Well, I would, uh, I would suggest since it's a conditional use permit, um, there must be something to do with the development of the CSD, like a setback issue or something? There is, yes ma'am. So we have a setback issue. When they built the house, they built it three feet away from the property line, and active setback is 50 feet per front and rear yards. Uh, so our conditional use permit will allow us to maintain that three foot distance to our property line. Then can I suggest that we, if it's possible, because normally for CUPs we try to take positions you know, and it's for, if it's for projects that work well in our community, we try to support them, and ostensibly that matters to regional planning. Right. So if you wouldn't mind, it would, I would suggest you maybe agendize yes, your sure. issue at, for a time that's convenient okay, to you. Sure. And this, now the public has time to comment. If they oppose or not oppose, they can let us know. Um, and and any information you're willing to share with us, we'll post on the website so people can look at it, okay. and they can come in and say, yeah, go, or, we don't like this because you know, whatever. Right. And I'll just set up a time with you through email. Yeah, that's uh, perfect. Okay. Yeah, just we meet on the first and third Monday, so. Okay. I don't know. That's great. I'll do that then. Okay. Question Thank you guys. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and are you going to know the answer to this? Why would they be looking for CUP and not a variance? Because I believe the Acton CSD, very, I can when, when the people who wrote forward. the CSD in the 90s wrote it, they wanted, they're not, they wanted to be very hard to not get changes to the CSD, so they asked regional planning to make it a CUP process rather than a variance process. So that's why. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Bernie Martin. I'm a field representative for someone in Tom Lackey. Um, I just wanted to come out and bring up a couple bills that actually are of interest to Acton. So um, two bills. In particular, SB 409. It's a bill actually authored by Senator Scott Will, who represents Acton on, we'll say, most or large parts of the Antelope Valley, as well as Assemblyman Lackey, who does represent Acton, as well as literally from Acton up to the Yellow Valley, up to Cal City, Boron, Edwards Air Force Base, and all the way up to Phelan. So essentially, what SB 409 does is strengthens restrictions <coughs> on people caught illegally dumping. I know it's been a big problem in our area. I mean, I've lived here for 18 years, and that's always been a problem. So essentially what this does is, previously it would just be a slap on the wrist for most people if you were caught illegally dumping, and it would be on the property owner to clean it up and deal with everything with that. So now it's actually bringing up that penalty to a misdemeanor. So if anyone's caught, now you're getting a misdemeanor for it. And it's also um, adding haulers and truckers to the list of people that can be fined for illegally dumping. Um, the other bill I have, is there a minimum fine for that? Um, that, right now, since it's still going through the legislative process. It's not a doesn't really matter if the minimum fine is <coughs> the, Essentially, as it goes on, the minimum fine and jail time or lack thereof would actually be established right now. It's still going uh, through the legislative process. Right. So there will still be some um, amendments. That would be more important to me than even what about the person they're hauling this um, 
material for. There are people with legal building per grading permits, their dirt is ending up in illegal places because no one's following the trail. Of course. So that's part of the amendment process. There's going to be a lot that's going to be adjusted to specifically target things of that sort and specifically target how certain things are being analyzed. It's still preliminary. It's still going through um, appropriations and everything else. I just wanted to bring it up to you guys. Just so you're aware, I'll have more information as it comes up. Randy, to that gentleman's point, we've asked in meetings with the county to do some sort of cradle to grave tracking. Um, so for example, what we learned was a place where a lot of the dirt was coming from was from the new Santa Monica train station, or bus station, some <coughs> me metro, metropolitan transportation station. Sure. And so the, uh, the contractor, though the EIR that was done for the project said the waste would be disposed of properly, the lead agency, I think it was Metro, didn't require as a mitigation measure that, that the dirt be, when it leaves the site, that some sort of ticket be issued, and that the site that receives it signs off and says we've received X amount. So, and then collecting the tickets. There, the, the whole cradle to grave concept is already done for all kinds of waste. There's no reason why dirt, particularly dirt that could be contaminated with oil or perk Pretty much or whatever, anything under the sun. There's no reason why we couldn't have a cradle to grave type uh, uh, tracking system for this. So I, I, I appreciate Senator Wilk and Assemblyman might be doing this, but maybe you can throw that in the hopper if that issue comes up to address definitely. this gentleman's point. I'll pass it on to our legislative director, definitely. Because they already do that. Caltrans, exactly. I'm sorry, DOT already does that. So. Okay. And then the other one I have is actually written by Senator Grove out towards Kern County. So this one essentially deals with anyone hauling horses. I know it's been a big issue. Anyone that has a horse trailer over X amount of pounds has to go get a uh, Class A license. That's been a major problem forever. So essentially what this bill does is remove some of the restrictions. So if you have a Class C and normal driver's license, as long as it's under 12,000 pounds, you can drive your horse trailer. If it's above 12,000, between 12 and 15,000, you just have to pass a quick written test and you're good to go. So that one is still going through. Is there a number? SB 415, sorry. So that one's still going through. Um, I'm not 100% sure if it's going to be in this legislative cycle or get pushed off to the next one. But as more information comes up, I'll definitely be sure to let you guys know. Thank you. And so then, or, on, on uh, the second one, uh, if, if the community would support it, they should probably contact Senator Assemblyman Lackey and Senator Wilkes so that they'll support it on the floor. Is that definitely. Right? Whether it be honestly just calling in, shooting us an email, most of the calls are going to end up going to me anyways. So just give us a call. If you support it, please let us know. If you oppose it for any reason, please let us know. We want to have more community involvement. And the final thing, I am, uh, we're trying to set up a community coffee out in Acton. We're planning a tentative date sometime in July. We're still trying to get location and everything hammered down. Once I get the flyers and we get everything uh, set in stone, I'll make sure to let you guys know as well. Okay. So Brandon, going back to the first where we <coughs> take some of the uh, the legal responsibility off the property owner for dirt that is hauled that they had nothing to do with. You know, a few meetings ago we had the, the meeting on the mulch and the state law for the mulch reads much like the dumping does right now. Um, so is that something that could be maybe included in this bill? I've, actually, I've been looking into it since that meeting and I've been okay. trying to figure out ways to work with that. Um, as it comes up on the, or as it comes up on the Senate floor, there will be some amendments then when it bounces down to the assembly floor um, I'll try and get a word in with our legislative director and see what amendments we can try and push and make and where we can work on it. Right now, it's step, uh, I believe it's still stuck in appropriations, which means there's certain limitations on what we can do. That would be great, because we had a lot of, heard a lot of security things. That would be, yeah. yeah, but I would definitely They're very closely that. related, <clears throat> at least with the penalties of, of you know, being responsible for somebody else's mess. Definitely, but I will find out about that and I'll move back to you guys. Right, thank you. Thank you. No thank Hi, my name is Tom Small. I've been attracted to acting for over 20 years. I've lived here for over 20. And uh, I have a couple of questions this morning. Um, first of all, I think that um, if your frontage of your lot is less than 100 feet, the 50 foot uh, does not, uh, you're omitted from that. If your 
frontage is less than 100 feet. Right? So read, read that, you'll see that. Um, <clears throat> my, my question is, I believe that uh, the community standard for your white for your front fence is white, is that not true? I believe the only requirement in the CSD as it stands today is if that perimeter fence not be more than 70% solid. Is that correct? Okay, I, I, I thought that, the, uh, the, that it read that your frontage fencing is to be maintained light. I, we that. can double check that, but it's on the website, the CSD. Um, so, if it is, and somebody's fence is not white, what do we do? Anytime that somebody doesn't comply with the CSD, right. regional planning has to start a, basically an enforcement case against that. So, and that, according to regional planning, I don't want to speak for the county, but they don't normally do that until somebody makes a complaint. So, you, you mean, if, let's say I was to start a complaint, I'd have to go down to regional planning? Oh, I think you can call them um, for, or email them. Boy, they don't like us, you know. Um, <laughs> so that's what you have to do. We don't do anything about it. They do something about it. Okay. No one in the community has any police powers. Okay. We're unincorporated. Okay. This county has, has all the jurisdiction over everything. I see. Okay. So another question is, um, isn't it true that your lights cannot uh, uh, light up your neighbor's yard? Your lights are supposed to be fully shielded. You are, I, I believe there are some exemptions for um, arena lights, but they can only be during a certain amount of time and they have to be turned off at a certain time. Yeah, these but all of the lights, lights are supposed to be shielded. Right. Okay. There are a lot of lights again, that do regional not planning that inactive. Regional planning again? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Tina well, Carlin is. So really, we have no power, really. We just write these rules and then you go send, send somebody off to regional planning because that's a nightmare down there. Of course, you all know. Nothing's going to happen down there. They don't like us. Sometimes we sometimes make up our own rules. They don't like our rules. They want us to change, and we won't. And then when somebody, one of our rules gets broken, we go to them, and they don't like us. He told me this. We have a lot of struggle with them, but on some things they've been very good about, like the dumping. They really were responsive to that. But another option is Tina Carlin. She works at regional planning in the Lancaster office. Okay. And she is. She can take anything that you said. She's. A really lovely lady, okay. and um, take any information you have to help you with that. Thank you and if that. you if you email the town council, we can give you her contact information if you like. Okay. So just on the fence issue, I'm um, looking at the CSD right now, and I don't see anything in here that says it needs to be white. Um, it's number seven in there, if, and if you want to go online and look it up to the. Uh, actintowncouncil.org website. We've got it up there for you. But there's nothing in here about uh, the color of the fencing. If you want to come up and look at this, we can as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other community comments? One more. All right. Yeah. Next up, comments from the last meetings. <laughs> I have two, two requested changes. Okay. Um, February 4, item 8, a comment about Mr. Gutman. I'd like it added that Mr. Gutman said that there are no surveys required for filming at Middleton, but there are surveys required for filming in Pulsar Rosa. That's why he had film its pulled for both. The same filming shot. Okay. That really bothered me, so I want to make sure that that's And I can email this to you. Well, you email it to me, perfect. And then the second one, this is just my yeah, no, yeah. April right. 1, in item 7, regarding the CPA issue. Um, Tom pointed out, when they said that their CPA bases their rates on Edison's rates, Tom pointed out your rates should be based on the actual cost to get the power right. to us. And I pointed out that Edison has a hefty profit built into their rates, right. so Perfect. they shouldn't build their rates based on Edison. And, they, and he said he would take that comment back. Okay. Perfect. So those are the You've got those two. Will you yes. just email them to me? Yes. yes. I think there's a period missing after Mr. Gutman. After the Mr. Gutman. G-U-T-M-A-N also is how you spell Mr. Gutman. How do you spell G-U-T-M-A-N? Sorry, I'm correct. Punctuation. No problem. 
I didn't have any. So we move to accept the minutes from, get the dates for um, me, please. <laughs> you should have put them on the email. That's okay. <clears throat> well, I can look them up on the email. I'm going to put them on April 15, February 4, March 4, and April 1. Those would be enough. Yes, that's great. With the, uh, the corrections Jackie yeah. suggested. Okay. All right. Do you have a second? Oh, I'll second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Thank you, Kelly, for yes, getting yes. that up to date. Yes. All right, uh, Treasurer's report. We've got $742.05. There was no income and no expenses for the last several months. <laughs> All right. Uh, sheriff's report. Okay, I gotta fix it. Hey guys, Debbie Martinez for those of you guys who have that team. Uh, that a lot of you guys in this room are new to that team. Good to see everybody here. Um, so since the beginning of this is going to be all the month of April, I got all the hard numbers in. We had two frauds, one six hey, so Debbie, could you come up front? Yeah. Last place, that way everybody doesn't have to braid their neck here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we had uh, two frauds, one sex felony, two uh, burglaries, and two burglaries to a vehicle. Um, and then the only other thing was uh, two suspected child abuse reports, and that was it. Wow. So that's for the whole month of April. Nine. Yeah, that's for you. Thank you. But um, afterwards, feel free to come talk to me and get my number or anything you guys need. Um, love to sit and chat with you guys and see what your concerns are. Um, I'm gonna try to make myself as available as I can for you guys' needs. Um, you guys already know, <laughs> we're, we're uh, this is a little bit different uh, approach than last time, okay? Thank you. Oh, and uh, for the legal dumping I forgot to mention, um, I know the CHP and the District Attorney's Office has a task force that's been going after the, the actual, like, trucks and the companies with the trucks and stuff. So that's deterred it where they're actually seeing an uptick in Lake LA now of deaths. And we're seeing it down here. So, I mean, it moved a cobble along, but at least we know it's having some sort of effect on our, our community because you know, they're getting them, they're citing them, and all that good stuff. So that's, that's a, something else for that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Good evening. So a few little announcements for today. First, I just want to make sure everybody knows on um, Monday, May 27th, it's Memorial Day, the library will be closed. Uh, so don't bother coming by. Um, just some upcoming programs we've got coming, uh, some really soon. On Friday, May 10th, that's this coming Friday, we have a Mother's Day craft activity. Kids can come on in and um, they can make little bath bombs for mom. So dads or grandpas in the audience, or grandkids, hint, hint. Come on by on Friday at 10.30 a.m. Um, let's see here. Next week, Tuesday, May 14th, we've got an um, origami program for kids coming in. They'll make all kinds of paper things. Um, <laughs> lots of paper things. Hopefully not airplanes. Uh, we'll leave that for middle school. Um, another program I have coming up, uh, Saturday, May 18th. I had these guys here last year um, uh, from Public Works, and they're coming again this year. It's for the Smart Gardening Workshop. They're going to come in, they're going to talk about composting, they're going to talk about worm garden beds, and how you can grow and make all of these. And then after the program, they will be selling compost barrels and worm, uh, worm bins at a discounted rate. So again, that's gonna be Saturday, May 18th, 9.30 in the morning to 11 a.m. It was a huge turnout last time, hoping for the same this time. Uh, just one more program I'm gonna point out. On Saturday, May 25th, so closer to the end of the month, one o'clock in the afternoon, I have a Native American pottery workshop. So um, there's going to be a guy here. He's going to work at, guide everyone through making some pottery. Should be kind of fun. 
other than that, that's what I've got, unless anyone's got any questions for me. All right, thank you. Thank you. So we'll move him down and if he shows up, we'll come back around to him. Um, so the next thing would be the animal control, care control. Uh, I'd like to ask a uh, resident, Charlene, to come up and kind of give some context for what prompted <laughs> us inviting you guys here. And, So what brings us here tonight is the vicious attack where my mom was injured and her dog, Mina, was brutally killed. On the morning of March 6th, my mom walked just outside her home with her beloved miniature schnauzer, Mina, who was on a leash. Two dogs came up, viciously killed Mina, and attacked my mom. These dogs pinned my mom up against her door where she was trying to get away from them. They were biting my mom and her dog and left blood stains all over her door and elsewhere. One of the dogs tried pushing their way into the house to continue the attack. Even after my mom got into the house with Mina, the dogs again tried attacking through the door. They were incessant. Afterwards, they went on to another home where they were trying to go after a horse. After 911 calls were made, the sheriff's department refused to come out and passed it off to animal control. They would only refer my dad to the Lancaster shelter, of which Acton is not even covered by Lancaster. After three hours, my husband made several phone calls in order to try to get a sheriff's car out, even to just take a statement of facts. They finally came out, but they still did not want to take a report. After my husband and I spoke to the deputies, they finally said they would write a report. After waiting several weeks for the report, I contacted the Palmdale Sheriff's Station for a copy. The record secretary was puzzled and told me to call back because something did not look right. I called back and the secretary said the file indicates, quote, report voided as not needed. I then spoke with the deputy who said he would write the report. And he told me he would not write a report because in his opinion, there wasn't enough of a backing to justify a report being made. He said we had to file a report with public health, but that is something that was already done by the veterinarian and supposedly by the doctor who treated my mom. The deputy told me that I may go into the station and pick up a copy of the tag for that day. The tag gives no viable information regarding the events that took place that day. In fact, the tag does not even account for the 911 calls, which were made by my father and my neighbor. The deputy went on to say, quote, maybe your mom shouldn't have put her hand in the dog's mouth, unquote. First off, my mom didn't put her hand in the dog's mouth. Secondly, this deputy does not know the first-hand account of what actually took place because he never took, or never took a report from my mom, who was the victim. Animal Control was no notified via 911, and then direct calls were made by my dad, a neighbor, and myself, and they did not respond until over three hours later. Upon arrival, after looking at the picture of the dogs, the field officer knew right away who these dogs were, and they knew they were aggressive. He clearly had a history with these dogs. These dogs not only made the attack at my mom's home, they went on through the neighborhood and to a neighbor's house threatening her and her horses. The dogs had blood on them, and even some passers-by thought that they were injured, but it was my mom's and her dog's blood on them. The LA County Sheriff's Department says that we should only call 911 if it's an emergency. I'm unsure how this would not qualify since it was a threat to the safety of our neighborhood. Here are the issues. What I'm asking for, what LA County Sheriff's Department policy and procedure states that all dog bites are to be deferred to animal control. The deputy stated that this is not a criminal incident, so there are no grounds to write a report. The owner of the dogs is in violation of Penal Code Section 398A and B and Section 39, excuse me, 399 Section B. My mom received owner's information and etc. over a month later from the LA County Animal Control. But according to those penal code sections, she should have been notified within 48 hours of the attack of all vaccination records and the owner's information. My mom was supposed to be notified within the 48 hours, but it didn't happen. So why isn't the homeowner held accountable for the penal code violations, at the very least giving the victim their information and vaccination history of the dogs? 
Also, since when is it proper policy and procedure for a deputy sheriff to tell a victim that she should not have put her hand in the dog's mouth when A, that isn't what happened, and B, the deputy did not even know the facts since he refused to take the report? <coughs> Next, animal control communication is lacking. The field officer would not get back to my mom regarding information about the incident in any type of timely manner, sometimes not at all. It took several phone calls in order to find the appropriate people to talk to in order to gain an understanding as to the status of the incident, including being given the wrong numbers, which were fax lines. My mom and others were living paranoid, not knowing whether these dogs were going to be released again to the owner to continue their aggressive behavior. Once the proper people at Animal Control were contacted, the communication did get a little better. But we are still to this day wait, awaiting any type of response from the records department and the field officer as to why the field officer would deliberately leave out pertinent information out of the report that was submitted to the critical care unit, such as the veterinarian's report, as well as photographs of my mom's deceased dog, showing the entrance wounds, etc., from the veterinarian's office. Service in the Acton and Aquadilce areas are lacking regarding both animal control and the sheriff's department. Response times are not good, the lack of priority is not good, and the lack of follow through after the fact is not acceptable. Here are some solutions, possible solutions. We need better enforcement. Our area is underserved, not only in this situation, but as evidenced by the other items which come across your table here as the town council. We need to streamline the protocol for reporting dog attacks, which both the LASD and animal control should have um, some type of continuity regarding the protocol and who notifies public health, whose job is that. We need more animal control officers. If the response time is based upon the lack of officers, then the county needs to reappropriate monies to add those officers. We need stiffer penalties for dog owners who do not properly and humanely contain their dogs. Following an offense, the owner should have to have an inspection as to the proper housing for their dogs. Next, actually enforce the laws that are already in place, such as the leash law 10.32.010. The leash law prohibits any dogs from running at large on any public street, park, or other public areas, or upon private property, such as my mom's, other than that of the dog owners. A dog must be restrained by a substantial leash not exceeding six feet, and be in the control of a competent person when off the property. Every single day, dogs are reported to be found or missing on social media in the Acton and Aquadilce area. I am not talking about the occasional little fluffy who gets loose. I'm talking about those numerous dogs who are just roaming the town. We need to stop the repeat human offenders who have a history of owning dogs of which they do not take responsibility for, and yet the county continues to give their dogs back, even knowing they are aggressive. Animal Control knew these dogs right away, and they said they had picked them up before for aggression as they prevented a neighbor from leaving their own home, holding them hostage. These dogs were even acting with aggression while in the custody of Animal Control back in December, but they were released back to the owner anyway. Animal Control claims to want to protect people and other animals from dangerous dogs, yet they release them back to those very offending owners. Practical penalties should include offenders who have to serve community service, maybe by cleaning animal control kennels, caring for other dogs impounded. Think of the money that the county would <coughs> save if they actually had those offenders serve in the community um, service uh, situation at our local animal control facilities. Monetary penalties, charge higher amounts for violations, the owner in this situation eventually relinquished his dogs. He paid $10 to relinquish those dogs. After the attack, the owner should be billed for investigation costs, boarding, adoption coordination, if that's the case, or euthanasia if it's warranted. I do not believe in breed profiling. I believe any dog has the ability to bite. But when dogs have the propensity to be aggressive, the utmost responsibility should be placed on those owners to properly and humanely house their dogs to prevent injury to others or the dogs themselves. It is not the dog's fault, but it is the owner's fault. My mom and dad are devastated, along with our entire neighborhood, about what happened on March 6th. 
It is my hope that no one should have to go through what my mom went through, let alone the lack of priority displayed by the county agencies that are involved. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Daniel Barrio. I am the Deputy Director of Operations for the Department of Animal Care and Control for the North County. Today we have Karen Stepp. She is the uh, manager for the Castaic Animal Care Center. She is the, her care center is the uh, care center that services this area. And we also have uh, Lieutenant Kim Schumann. Uh, Lieutenant Kim Schumann is the uh, lieutenant in charge of our central case processing unit. So this is the unit that processes all the um, dog attacks, dog bites, um, anything that qualifies as a uh, potentially dangerous dog investigation. Yeah. Just take one. And I'm Ron Schaefer, I'm the captain of the <coughs> Sheriff's Station. This is just some information I brought with me. And my name is Karen Steff, I'm the manager of the Cassidy Channel Health Care Center. And this is Lieutenant Kimshu. And um, she's in charge of um, the critical case process. If I can. Um, okay, sure. Go ahead. So, uh, I've been on the job for 28 years, and when I first came on, we would take a dog bite report, uh, but we've changed our policies to where the best resource is animal care and control. And so, we revised our department policy that we do not take a dog bite report. We defer to the experts of animal care and control. A 911 call, we will respond to a 911 call. We get numerous kinds uh, of all different topics, uh, things that people believe are an emergency, they will kind of call 911 and we will address that. Uh, our resources are limited uh, to what we go to and we go to people issues first, of which a dog bite would be an issue that we should get somebody there. Uh, we are not in the practice of turning issues around on the people who are calling us just try to, to say that it's their fault and we would address that. Uh, and I would like to talk to you more about that and we can talk about the deputy's conduct. Uh, we do not find that that's appropriate and, and we would address that and we have avenues for addressing that. Going back to the dog issue, their animal issue, again we would defer to what we consider the experts of animal care and control to deal with those issues. Well, when you say you defer, Animal care and control, but you also say you would respond. We would respond to provide the, the first responder service to be there, uh, but we're going to let the experts deal with the issues. So the deferring would happen safety. after the response, correct? Not yes. in lieu of the response. So, in my experience correct. as a patrol deputy, okay. we do respond to vicious animal attacks. So, like, we're going to be there if we need to shoot the dog to prevent further damage or you know loss of life. That's what we're going to step right. up and do. Um, after the fact, then if there's any bites that occur and the dog gets wrinkled or whatever, then, then that's when the you know, animal control comes in, but not until the scene is safe. So, so basically our, our response would be to no, no, no further injuries to the person if preventable if we can. So would it be fair to say that what happened on 6th of March was a, a snafu or? or? I, I would have to look into that further as far as what the response was, why was it delayed? I, I think we would be really, if you wouldn't mind, we would be really grateful to know, you know, the best way to not repeat mistakes is to learn right. the mistakes that were made. So, and I would say there is or isn't. Right. It sounds like there was something went wrong. So, so what, what you're really saying is that you respond and render the situation safe. Correct. Right. Yes. We couldn't get a car out there at all. Right, and, and that, that, we'll, we'll look into that. We'll look yeah. into it and see what happened there because that's obviously not right. And, a, and, and, and another comment you're aware that Animal Control's phone service says, in a case of emergency, call 911. And, and again, that's, that's the idea is that we are our first responders and we would come out there. So, you know, <laughs> reporting, documenting, 
if there's uh, taking animals into protective custody or arresting them, if you will, uh, we're going to defer to the experts because we would get on the phone with them and have them respond. But that's, that was the frustration that the 76 year old woman was being fit. Right. Well, I called that day um, because the two dogs came down to my house and I had a horse in the arena and I called 911. I'd already called animal control and they were supposed to be on their way out. And the dog was kind of really weird, got up on top of our wood pile about six feet high had all his hackles up, was growling at my dog. He was acting very strange, like a cat, like going back and forth. So I called 911 and they told me that animal control was on their way out and they, they were too busy to come. So and then again, like, wait, wait, animal, animal control did. was too busy or deputies were too busy? They were too busy. Who was too busy? 911, deputies okay, were. Okay, so deputies, all right, all right. Yeah. Um, so actually, and that's all the same day that <laughs> Charlene's <laughs> mother got got bit, correct? Yeah, same bad. dogs. Okay, same dogs. Same dogs. Yeah. Again, obviously something, yeah. some some yeah. link in the chain didn't function correctly that day. She and, gave a reference in the letter that Charlene okay. read. Okay. And it, I'll look into it and see what's going on. I'll listen to the nine one one calls and, and then we'll see. Like if someone needs to, if this needs to be addressed, the personnel at the desk, I'm more than happy to talk to them about our policies and stuff. I think that's where confusion was because when even a phone call later trying to get a car there just to do the report, not 911, just the desk, yeah. the person answering the phone says, we don't do bot dog reports. The deputy sitting next to him goes, yes, we do. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's what I'm talking about, streamlining yeah. protocol. The so protocol we can, needs to be clarified. Right. So then you're not stuck in a town council meeting where we're all mad. <laughs> that's what needs to be you know. Yeah. So we have certain expectations. So we just. So do we. Yeah. So I think that's what we're trying to strive for is get clarified. Absolutely. So let me just, what is the language that should be used when the 911 call is made? So when somebody in Acton <laughs> is being attacked by a vicious dog that the 911 operator takes it seriously and realizes that this is an actual emergency. Now, is there some suggested yeah, language that no, they should the use? the fact that the attack is happening now and there is a person being bit or attacked, <coughs> That oh, should be sufficient to get somebody out. It's more than enough. That's good. The woman with the horses, did you place the call to animal control as well? And I also called, I was out of town with my husband. I was handling all of it via phone in Phoenix, mm -hmm. and I made multiple calls to the Cal State Center, right. trying to get ETAs. Can't tell you when they're going to be there. You do understand we have these loose dogs, they're 150 pounds each. They're aggressive, they're known to be aggressive. When are you coming? We can't tell you, we don't know. That's what we were dealing with for three hours. And they were, they were afraid to come out of their house, especially now, finding out those two dogs were holding a neighbor hostage on their at their house on Salty Dog Road on the other side of where they lived. Yeah. And they couldn't even come in or out of their house. And so that was in that December? Was, that was in December. That was in December. Right. And they were picked up. Yeah. Right. They were picked up. We, had, we received a call in December yeah. for three large dogs. I'm not sure what the other dog was. Yeah, I don't know what it was. And um, it was running loose, rolling. Right. It was November okay. 30th, yeah. And then you so guys when, held them until the 11th. And we picked them up, and then they came in about you know, on the 11th to say that they were their dogs. Right. So then we. Um, made sure that they were all vaccinated. We altered them. We did everything, right. and we usually do a property inspection. I'm not sure if it was done in this case, and we um, release the dogs back to them on the first time. And we also make a report for the CCPU if we had anybody attacked. But nobody said they were attacked. There was no bites at that time. They were running loose at so, large. Right. So, so I, I'm, I have a question. Sure. Uh, what does it take for you not to return an aggressive dog? To, I mean, it, it's, yeah, I look, um, what I just heard, and maybe I misheard it, but if the dog doesn't bite, they're going to be returned. And that's it's, very disturbing. If it's a really aggressive dog, it doesn't break the skin, but it's still aggressive. Well, it didn't try to bite anybody. Nobody reported a bite or an attack. So it's it just said aggressive dogs. It's, it's, it's very situational. You know, it really depends on the, the description given at the time the call comes in. You know, it really depends on the information. It, the, the, the case is only as good as the information of the person calling in is. But so we if we're get getting the dog, right. you have the dog. Right. If it's acting aggressively, I, I understood that 
the dog was aggressive in the care of a animal care control. Is that Which, not yeah, factor? Well, it, it was, when a dog is in the cage at animal care and control. Um, but let me back up. I, I okay. think her question is, as you arrive on the scene and you're seeing the dog acting aggressive, but that's not always an indicator of a dog being aggressive. Uh, dogs flee because they're scared. So their first you know, defense is, I, I'm gonna run. I can tell you when I used to be an animal control officer, there were many times where I had to follow dogs and by the time I was able to get them cornered, they were coming at me and I would have to use my control pole and once they would get to the care center, well they were fine as can be. So it's very situational and it's, it, it just really depends on uh, who's calling and the information that we have. I know I already said that, but uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's just really based on the totality of the picture that, that you're getting not just one sign of, of, of the, that the dog may be giving you. Well, my question was about is there, is there the totality of the event, mm -hmm. right? If the dog never bites anybody, is that the only marker for deciding whether the dog should go back to the owner? So, for example, no, okay. the dog in your care is very aggressive. Okay, uh, if, if we can talk about a dog that is designated potentially dangerous in L.A. County, um, there's three scenarios. Okay, um, 1037020A is, and it's in the, these, the pamphlets that I handed out, um, is a dog that on two separate occasions within a 36 month period is at large and charges someone causing them to have to do a defensive action, like jump in a truck, jump behind a fence, climb on a car. If that happens twice within three years, we can move forward with a potentially dangerous dog investigation, have a hearing, declare the dog dangerous, and then administratively control that dog. The <coughs> second one is if a dog unprovoked attacks a human being, biting them. And the third one is if a dog, while off of the property, attacks and injures, a, injures another animal. So those are the three scenarios where we can move forward with an investigation and get a designation on the dog. Uh, there's vicious, a designation of vicious, which essentially the only two options for that is there's uh, stricter uh, conditions placed on uh, the, the owner. We require that they have a kennel with a cement floor, with a ceiling. Um, they have to post their property, that there's a vicious dog on the property, and they have to contact the post office, UPS, water guy, so, and, and community like they would have to contact the county council just to let everybody know that the dog's there. And then the other one is Is that including euthanasia. the neighbors? They have to notify the neighbors? Um, no, they don't have to notify the neighbors, no. That's, it's not written in the Can we code. make that change? I, we can suggest it, um, but I'm sure you know that having things well, any, changed yeah, in any our changes Title to 10, our title yeah. will, will require the approval of the board. Well, I was just going through the changes to Title 10 you guys made about a month, a year and a half ago, right? Yes. yes. And a lot of that was to make things safer, so. Right. What happens if the owner doesn't comply? Then we move forward with, uh, we file with the district attorney. Um, we file for misdemeanor charges and the removal of the dog from the property. So that's a question, if it goes to um, Captain Schaefer yourself. So what's with these penal codes? They're very clear this owner violated these. So what do we do with that? We enforce Title 10. Uh -huh. um, the penal codes, I believe the ones that you stated were um, owning a mischievous dog. Um, it's you have to notify within 48 hours um, all of your, you have to divulge all of your information as being the owner of that dog and contact information as well as vaccination information. Okay. And um, also, yes, if you are knowingly, that's 399B, if you own um, or have custody and you know that the animal has the propensity to be aggressive, you have to take the means to properly house that, that animal. And, um, and so, oh, and then the 38, 398B part, it has to qualify as a bite, which <coughs> qualified as being right. bitten. So, in my opinion, this owner was in violation of all three of those. Um, so, what happens with, with the propensity to be aggressive? Mm -hmm. The designation would be proof of that. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I 
I'm not sure how you would prove that he knew that his dogs were aggressive. No, no, but 398A, if they know that or have reason to know that that animal has bit someone or attacked someone, they have to notify the victim within 48 hours. There's four subsections under 398, and the fourth one applies to the lady here tonight that was bit. That's okay. why I just that's how you, we're quoting California State Penal Code sure. here. So I'm just and I right, right, are right, these county right. ordinances you're talking about? Yes. yes. Okay, well, we're talking about the California State Penal Code. Sure. Well, we can take. We'll, we'll take that information and we'll look through, you know, what happened. And if it applies, then you know, sure, we'll we'll, we'll get back to you on yes, that. Yes, it definitely applies because that's why we were so incessant about trying to get information from the field officer, trying to get information. And I was mm -hmm. finally put through to um, Lieutenant Schumann. She was great getting us where we needed to be. But to get to her was a horrible uphill oh. climb. And nobody would divulge information. We need to know vaccinations. We need to know what's going on. Does she need to be treated for you know, her injuries? Sure. You know, yeah. for yeah. rabies I have or whatever. Cards too. And if anybody wants one, feel free to yeah, they're, they're they're just, <laughs> It just was very frustrating because sure. we had no owner information. Does the dog live next to us? Does it live three miles away? These dogs are gigantic, and they can they can travel a lot of ground, and um, and so that's what did not help her emotional well-being. I'll just tell you that. And the rest of our neighbors didn't even know. Well, where are they from? Are they back at the house? You know, are they? You know, it caused a lot of undue frenziness. <coughs> that it's not okay, and that that is very clear. The owner was aware of it. They knew it. You know, so why didn't they follow through? And so yeah. I'm asking about the enforcement of those penal codes. Does it say in the code who's supposed to enforce it? No, no. In the, no, not in the county. Oh, how is it to be state punishable? Code. Well, it's it's his violation of the section infraction is punishable by a fine of a whopping hundred dollars. Well, we but be. it's the point of the matter of following through. Um, I still think that should be upped, and that was part of my. You know, I'm not I'm not saying it just make them clean kennels, make them go to the facilities. Have it as a, there's got to be some sort of penalty. That's what we, we do can, with criminals. Yeah, if sure. the penalty is higher, we're going to be a little bit more, we're going to serve a little bit more due diligence in not having these dogs run around and attack I, people. I think in fairness to you, ma'am, and I'm very sorry this had to happen to you, um, what we can do as a department is review the case and submit it to the DA. See if he'll take the case. If he does, then, um, well, the owner will have to face, you know, this, justice that way. Uh, but it will be at the at the DA's discretion whether he'll take the case or not. Can you also okay. look into changing Title Ten to clarify your responsibility or your responsibility, well, the, whoever, the, to, so to implement to enforce state code regarding well, penal state, code? State, state, any penal code book is any police officer or in this case animal control officer that can enforce that. So you could so enforce it's not, that. Yes, okay. we enforce state. Well, then could you? Could you? You have make to make that up with the district attorney. Yeah, I and mean, the district again, attorney would take the case. And never notice on rabies. How? how well, well, why? Um, but she again, didn't get that information. I, I wish you would have. You, you could have called and we could have said, yeah, it has a current rabies because it had a current rabies. We got the dogs in, impounded, and we held them until um, they were actually euthanized. Mm -hmm. They never went back to that property. We continuously call and ask for a copy of the report. Can we have the information? Can we have owner information, vaccination information? That was not divulged. That's they probably the will redact those on. unless it goes for a case I or a hearing. I have all that now. Yeah. I mean, she luckily got it all now, but that was yeah. over a month later. You know, and uh, so anyway, that's what I, again, I'll say about streamlining protocol, information, the field officer, it's almost impossible to get a hold of, and even right now, the legal department um, there's still some questions about why pertinent information was left out of the report. Um, it was emailed uh, several times, phone calls. And you haven't gotten a response from them? No response. Okay, and so I don't want to say the officer's name. I'm not here to, to defame anyone. It's right. just that particular field officer <clears throat> did not follow through. And these were pertinent things I felt that should have been part of the report. I mean, sure. obviously, the end result was, unfortunately, unfortunately, situation is okay because now we know the dogs are no longer a threat however it just it, that is important that could have been very vital what if those dogs because one of them was potentially up for adoption to the rescue i was told eventually they were both euthanized but one of them potentially was going to be 
released, not privately, but to a, um, or not publicly, but to a private rescue. It would have and, to be a rescue with a waiver. And, right, uh, right. There's and no I'm, rescue that's probably going to come up and get right, one of those dogs. Right, right. And I, and so I we were also, um, we have to hold them when they're doing the investigation. <laughs> right. So we held them. Right. Not all dogs that bite are impounded. The um, people that do the quarantine is the public health department. They are in charge of all the quarantines. Right. They either quarantine at home, which everybody thinks that we take every dog in that bites, we wouldn't have enough room in our care center if we took in every dog that bit. Unfortunately, you know, we can't do that. So a lot of quarantines are done at home. If they're, they've bit somebody and they've gotten out and we have a prior on them, we're gonna take them and hold them, which we did in this. The dogs had been out, they were fixed, they were altered. We tried to work with the owner in any owner that comes in. You know, most people want their dogs back after they bite, but then there's certain circumstances that they have to bite by. Right. So these dogs were brought in and they were never released. Yes. And right. then on the second time, because <clears throat> we didn't have a report of anybody coming forward with information that they had attacked. Correct, and, and, and that's that. Like I said, the undue frenziness is, is or frustration yeah. is. We just want to know. We just sure. want to know. Is are they? Yeah, at we home could have given you the rabies information. I have to tell you, other people I know have specific situations. Again, no names or whatnot. We know personally of two particular dogs for five years that have gone after people, taken back, gone after people, taken back. Now, not like this a vicious situation. But those dogs, it took five years for them to finally go, you're not getting them back. You know, this is enough, enough. So maybe it was under your declaration where it has to happen during so many, so much of a period of time, ripping head vendors kind of a thing. But it, it was a very long um, process. And I've been hearing this through the community. I don't have firsthand facts, but it's kind of a common theme, unfortunately. A, they were just given back to the people, then the dog does it again. And that's where the fear is. Um, there's one lady who was attacked um, on her horses um, on April 6th. The dog, nothing was done for the dog. The dog is still at the house. Um, nothing was done. Right now, I don't have first-hand account. I was not involved in that. Um, you would have to talk to that particular victim. But there's a sense of frustration. Even if it's not 100%, you know, a lot of people like to talk, and, and we've talked about like social media, people like to complain on it, but unless they actually report it, put it, you know, call and actually file something, obviously it's just a lot of talk, it talks cheap. But um, it, there is a sense of frustration, why bother? They're just gonna give them back. The dog's just sitting there, we're just waiting for it to buy us again. And so that's, you know what I'm saying? Right. So we really want that no, it's, open it's, conversation it's, it's, to put people's no, concerns to that part too. too. The, uh, the particular case with the horse, mm -hmm. um, no prior history on the dog. The gentleman had only owned it for six months. It was a brand new dog. He had a kennel. Uh, his gate was faulty. The dog got out through the gate because the people on the horses stopped in front of the property. Uh, they were yelling at a car that was speeding by. The dog pushed through the gate, um, attacked the horses. Uh, the owner of the horses opted not to take the dogs to, or the, uh, the horses to the veterinarian. As from a case standpoint, if I don't have medical records from a veterinarian stating that this was a dog attack that happened on this date, I don't have a case. A lot, of the, times, a lot of the times our, our challenges are, because we understand that communities are very, very close knit, and sometimes you might have a neighbor who their dog might have gone out and, and you don't want to complain against your neighbor because part of the, of, of the process of, of going through her unit is you're going to have to submit a declare or a declaration, a sworn declaration. Mm -hmm. And usually once we start getting into written statements from folks, um, some folks are very apprehensive about that and that ties our hands. Um, you know, not every case is like that, right. but it's, those are some of the challenges that but we wait, You guys said two different things. You said a vet report, you said a written declaration. There, what there's several parts of it. Both. Yes. Yeah. What if we put forward dollars a vet bill just to get exactly. action? Well, absolutely, there and may be liability on the owner's part. In most cases, uh, we get them. What do you mean? Uh, I'm, she, I'm, she was saying well, you have to have a vet okay, report. So you, for a, for a dog bite to be considered legitimate, and you've done only a sworn affidavit, right. which was a great change you made to Title right. 10. But you also need a vet report, which could cost the 
a lot of money. I mean, it, no, we just call the vet and say we need the records for this attack or incident, and then they forward us the medical records. If what happens if you don't choose to take your horse to the vet? Right. Then there's no case, even though they're not necessarily. Well, we, it would be hard for us to take it before a hearing officer because the hearing officer is going to ask, how do I know these injuries occurred on this date, and how do I know they were made by a dog? So the affidavit doesn't isn't sufficient. It it is sufficient, but it helps if you're going to win a case. <coughs> if I want that records because when I take the case before a hearing officer, I I want that case bulletproof. I, I want vet records, I want, I want written statements signed under the penalty of perjury, I want photographs, I want witness statements. Well, I think that that's important for people to understand because, mm -hmm. sure. you know, taking your that's, horse to the vet is right. sometimes not a small right. thing. Right. Right. Or so the, the, the injuries that the horse, I mean, I can understand her not taking them to the vet, they were, they were scratches, surface scratches, um, but still. So what, in, okay, so what ended up happening with the dog? What did we do? Did the, we do? Um, there was a property inspection done. It was Officer Riva that went out. Uh, the kennel that the dog was kept in was perfectly functional and sound. The front gate, he replaced the front gate so there was no longer a gap. It's a huge gate. The gate um, passed inspection and the dog is on the property. Now, she also issued what's called a 901 SNP, stands for Safe Neighborhood Program. That's, that's something that it's routinely issued at every bike call. In the event that it goes to our unit and we don't move forward, and then there's another incident, it states plainly on the SMP form, your dog was accused of doing A, B, C, and D, getting off the property and uh, nipping the ankle of the next door neighbor. If anything happens again, we're moving forward. So it's, it's kind of like our first, second, and third strike. And I appreciate that. I, I, I do understand that you need some documentation, obviously, yes. to solidify the case. That's why, if you understand <coughs> my frustration right. as a no, court reporter, I, I, I to not accept evidence in your case of a, a vet's report, what you're asking for, right. a veterinarian's report, and photographs. In, so your, in your particular case, though, we yeah. didn't go forward with, obviously, Fine. the dogs because they were deceased. Right. But that doesn't mean that we can't file it with the district attorney to file charges against the dog owner. Uh, there's a question back here. Yes, yeah. sir. There's a couple of them. I'm yes, going to say that if you haven't already filed with the district attorney, shame on your department. Because you guys have no problem coming to an 88 year old person's house, veteran, to look for whatever fees they may owe on a dog that's six months overdue. Yeah. yeah. And signing me for a cat that I don't even own, but the person parked down the street in a blacked out vehicle thinks that it's my cat because she's seen it on my property. Well, that would be our licensing department. I don't think we're here talking about licensing. Well, it's animal right. control, yeah. and right. um, it's so, part of it, and our fees are paying for you, ma'am. Okay, I'm sorry. You said, you said you were cited for a cat you don't own? That is correct, sir. Okay. That's what I told her. I said the cat showed up. It's not my cat. So she showed up and left the ticket on my house one day when I was sleeping after I got home. Did you have to appear in court for that ticket? No. Well, you're supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was just a notice. Did you bring it with you? Did you bring it? Did you bring it with you? See, this is the kind of thing that we need we need to know because well, if you're, if you're being, I'm just saying, shame on you. You can cite the owners of the dog. You got 30 days to get that case together, and before they have to appear in court, that's what a cite is. A promise to appear, and you got 30 days to put your case together on. I think it should have been done rather than, especially if you put the dogs down. I mean, that's, that's horrible. I mean, that's, well, I mean, it's good they were put down, but I, I really think that you should, there should be some at the An officer, it's, there's a misconception um, for dogs at large. Uh, the, the violation has to be witnessed by the officer in order for the officer to, set, to issue a citation for a leash law. It's not yeah, because the sheriff didn't go out. Yeah, that's the lady was attacked. Well, that's different. 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 That's
Yes, I have a two-part question. Yes. First of all, when these vicious dogs were first picked up, did you do a visual inspection of the property where they live? Me personally, no. You didn't. No. You didn't see the great big hole dug underneath the gate <laughs> in the front of their property where they get out? No. no. And why weren't the owners made to enforce the fencing, enforce some kind of a kennel enclosure to mm -hmm. keep these dogs on their property? Why? That's my first question. Did you, do you not have visual, obviously, of this? Yes. Did I you, live did you in their neighborhood. Call it in. I'm, I'm live very close to the victims right here. Okay. And this has affected all of us. Okay. And yes, we drove by their property to look at it. And there is this great big hole dug underneath their very front gate where these dogs got out. And I don't understand why these irresponsible dog owners are not made to make things right. Why they're not penalized. Why? Why? No, you gave them back to them. And now look what's happened. That's my first question. Why? And then I have another question. Why did it take almost five years and hundreds of phone calls for you guys to come out and pick up my neighbors, two, not these two dogs, two other dogs who have continuously gotten out for five years. They've been very aggressive towards me, towards one of my other neighbors. They get in our neighbor's trash and throw it all over the yard. And they jump chain link fences and come in my yard and everybody else's. Finally, finally by a streak of luck, your guys were in our neighborhood the same day they were loose and we called you and they came right around the corner and picked these dogs up. But for five years you guys would come out, the owner of the dogs would not let you on their property, so you just turned around and went home. I don't understand this. Why can't you get a, a deputy sheriff to go with you with a search warrant and pick up these dogs? No, you just blew it off and went home. Time after time, almost five years, and we have the documented facts showing the phone calls we made. Did you bring those with you? No, I did not. Well, let me ask you this. How, how long were these animals picked up? Uh, last summer, maybe, Charlene? No, no. When were they picked up? No, about a month and a half ago. Uh, I can actually, I can actually yeah, see you guys ahead of here. Thank you. You call Cascade and it's a three to four hour ETA. And then by the time you guys show up, the dogs have already made their rounds and have gone back under the fence. And you know that little slip of paper you hang on the gate? He just comes home and throws that away. Yep. But, but I have no credibility because you have to witness it, not me. And many of your officers have come out and visited with me. They've been very professional, very polite. Hey, we have to catch him out, and I can't go inside the gate. Sorry, keep calling. So that's yeah. to answer your question so, why it took five years. So yeah. I see two questions. And First also, of all, okay, also, why do you guys have to respond from Castaic? Why can't you respond from Rockdale <coughs> or Lancaster? Why is it a three hour wait? Why? Well, See, I've got a lot of questions and no answers here tonight. Well, okay, let's take them one at a yeah. time. The first question is. These dogs were picked up in November and then returned. It, was the house inspected? And if so, how did you guys miss the big hole underneath? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get it. It wasn't inspected. That's the problem. Why? Not every single dog that goes into the animal shelter are we able to get out and inspect. Well, so I, think we should. Should. So, I mean, if it's a big dog, yeah, we're going to, a lot of times, if it's a second impound, we go out and inspect. Well, we no, have, I'm talking you know, about the first impound. These are hundred. If we inspected every dogs. single dog, we'd... Okay. 150 pound dog. It would kill me if it came after me, and I'm no short thing here, all right? You guys should be, should be inspecting the property where these animals live. It's as simple as that. So should we ask for that? I mean, what? How, how can we, we for we a large dog? Brother, how can we, we ask to, that if we know it's getting out? Then so, I, so I, I know, I'm just trying to trying to. I, I, all your questions need to be answered. So let's start with the first one. All right. How can we get animal care and control, or sheriffs, or whoever, mm -hmm. when it's a big dog picked sure. up the first time to inspect 
the place. Okay, so. Particularly here in Acton, because mm -hmm. loose dogs go for miles and your guys might not see them. Sure. It's not like this, uh, uh, you know, street. we're different here. Sure, so I how? So I think that um, what I would ask is um, when you're having that situation with that large dog, uh, please be as descriptive as possible. Because if all we get is there's a loose dog and we go out there and we pick it up, we have no way of assuming that that dog is one way or the other. You know, so if it could be one way or the other. friendly or vicious. vicious, friendly, not vicious, you know. Um, uh, so if you could be as descriptive as possible, then that would kind of help us to say, hey, well, you know, this dog was in, in, in well, the neighborhood. We are, we are, it, but, but again, you know, right. a loose dog is a loose dog. Mm -hmm. You right. can't but determine it's, if it's friendly or mean. You don't know. Hey, Len, let me yes. Your desk is very good at asking all the detailed questions, yeah. all 15 of them, yeah. and we give all 15 answers. Yeah. Okay. But what they do not give is an ETA. Can you give me an ETA after I've answered the 15 questions yeah. you're are they off the property? Are they near your pets? Are they going after your goats? Are they coming after you? We're familiar with this. Ongoing problem. Which direction did they go? All the above. And then when I ask, do you have an ETA? Well, I no, never can get an ETA. An ETA is usually two to three hours. And the day these dogs were finally caught, the she's referencing, the officer came out, dogs weren't around. He had another two or three calls on Crown Valley and it returned again. And then I got a cell phone call back number from somebody at your dispatch saying, hey, the officer's coming. Well, the officer made a right instead of a left where the dogs were. When I called that number back, pretty high tech now. When I called that number back, he reached a number that's no longer in service. <laughs> and so okay. it is what it is. Yeah. And so, but to answer your question, your desk and your dispatch, they do a heck of a job. Okay. They ask all the questions. Mm -hmm. I think the underlying issue here is Cascade. Cascade. And so, you know, it's like us with the Afton car to get you into the city or Leona Valley mm -hmm. or to Wrightwood. So, Castaic is, if you look at uh, just at the map, you know, Castaic is the closest center to common service here. Because if you're looking at Palmdale, um, you're, you're, you're assuming that Palmdale is coming just from the city of Palmdale. You know, and the actually the, the units servicing Palmdale have to go all the way to Little Rock, Lake LA, you know, Kurt even County. even even uh, Nenac, uh, Leona Valley. So if you're all the way over there and you're getting a call here, Castaic is closer. So is That's it fair to I'm say saying. that the area covered by Castaic and Palmdale together is over 1,500 square miles? That's a correct statement. We have two offices covering a third of LA County, 1,500 square miles. How do we get more, how do we get an office here? Or, uh, I mean, uh, how many animal care and control offices are covering urban LA? You got them all over, you got all, they're all over the place in a much smaller area. How, are, how can we get more than just two offices for, maybe it's 1,300 square miles, but it's flipping enormous, the area. Antelope Valley is almost 1,000 square miles. You're talking about Castaic as well and Santa Clarita and all that. So, is that, would that help? I mean, how, how many officers are there in that area? How many officers between Castaic and Lancaster? We have about eight. 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 Maybe a total uh, of eight for the whole, for the whole area. At one particular snapshot in time, you have eight officers on? Never. Yeah, no. so, we have seven yeah, yeah, that's so on, yeah. on a shift, on a given shift, what do you have? In service between the two? Anywhere from one to three, <coughs> probably. In a 1,500 square mile area. Well, and this is only Castaic and that's more than no. all the way up to Kern County. Yeah, the other thing that I just, I just want to be. Uh, Cable Canyon. Oh, yes. Excuse me. Cable Canyon, too? Yes. What about Castaic and Lancaster combined? No, I don't know what Lancaster is. Because just. To get from Castaic to Acton, everybody here During knows. Hour? The, 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 there's no easy way. It, it's you have to go through Santa Clarita, or you have to go all the way around through Leona Valley, mm -hmm. or Lake Hughes. So how can that you is not. Get... It's, I mean, you don't access. Nobody accesses Acton through Castaic or Lancaster area. It's a straight shot here. So maybe the resources could be reallocated where we're not being served. Maybe almost in a situation where they have to come across oh, like a demilitarized zone to get here. 
So how can Acton get transferred oh. to Lancaster? That's my question. Well, right now, um, it, the, the, the time to get from Lancaster to here and Castec to here is the same. Well, we're not. I, I'm sorry, I, I worked this area for eight years. So what, one of the things that we're really not talking about is that our animal control officers and our vehicles are not code three. So although you might Google it and you might map quest it and it'll give you the time and the distance, what it's not taken into consideration is the traffic. So we all know that the Antelope Valley is a, they commute down south in the morning Vice versa, you know, in and in the afternoon. So your your travel from Lancaster could possibly take longer because our vehicles and our officers are at the mercy of traffic. These guys can roll code three. We cannot. We can't even use the carpool. There's no good time to go. Can I just ask something? Yeah. yeah. I'm assuming the funding piece for the lack of manpower. So I'm assuming that, right? Because I mean, it's the county allocated funding to the county and that's what gives you your bodies. So what can we as citizens in this county do or what channel do we need to go through to put pressure on to get more service? We're clearly underserved. I believe we're underserved in our sheriff's department, we're underserved with our animal control. So what, who is it? Is it Port Charles over here with Catherine's office? So this? Okay, directly. So she's so yeah. Catherine is involved in the allocated money, like like the the. the we're talking about animal control and on sheriff's department. Yes, that's that's where the money. Is. So how do we get an office in Acton? Yeah. And I'm I not say being silly. I'm being no. Yeah. And so to, to have the same number of officers as Los Angeles does. No, just no, just no, 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 no. Have an office well, here, it, so we aren't having two offices covering <clears> 1,500. I would imagine that they have an office. No, well, let, let, let's, let's, let's shade that a little differently, though, from the standpoint of if you're talking about uh, Acton, I would all see, you know, it probably even up and around the bed. Well, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, let me, yeah, no, no, let, let me finish, though. It, it is, is and the that, west side of Palmdale. Yeah, well, okay, so. But, Palmdale's got one. It took yeah, 20 but, years to get into Palmdale. Or okay, years. but the, the point being is that we also have a lot of a, a completely different set of animals than, say, Santa Cruz, okay, for the most part. And we have horses. We have all sorts of, there's wild amateurs, there's the wolf connection, I mean, there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on, emus, there's all sorts of stuff. So um, th th it's a different subset. And I'm not saying like, yeah, full eight, you know, officers to deal with something like that, but some kind of substation. smaller substation that they could. Or don't, don't put it in active. What yeah. I'm saying is two offices for 1,500 square miles is not oh, enough really offices. Yeah. So, more well, offices. The people, for, not the square miles. That's the problem with all no, the No, it's apparently the distance to get here. No, I mean, but that, that's the reason why there's not more resources. You because it's 1,500 yeah. square miles <laughs> that's got, for the outside of those two cities, that's got 80,000 people. If, in if, two if cities, I may, call that Lancaster, that's 320,000. If, if I may interject, um, you know, one of the things, one of the really important things about having these kind of community meetings is you get to know the community, you know, um, and you know, you make those connections. You know, now you have a face to the, you know, to the name. Uh, and if one of the things that we do is, if, if we're getting multiple calls for loose dogs, or you know, we have, you know, certain people that like to take the lead on, on certain issues, you know, um, we'll come out and we'll saturate the area and we'll sweep. And whatever loose dog we see, we'll pick up and we'll take it to the Cascade Animal Care Center and we'll. You know, get the owners and get them cited. I, I mean, there's there's different things that we need to, that we can do. Maybe creatively, in absence of maybe additional staff, or while we get additional staff, or while you know uh, our our budget is getting you know if we get adjustments for that. You know, um, I I think it's a good opportunity to maybe you know make those connections like with you, sir, and you, ma'am. You know, um, if, if we're seeing that, you know. To make, to make that phone call either to, to Karen or, or to him or to myself, and you know, we'll, we'll gladly come out here and we'll gather other officers from other care centers and sweep the area, you know? And as okay, if you sweep the area and these dogs are not out, what else can you do? Are you allowed to get a search warrant 
and go up and knock on the guy's door and pick up his dogs if they're back in his yard? Are you allowed to do that? Well, we could, to, we could try to get a search warrant, well, but whether or not a judge would sign off on it based we would, on we that would need criteria. Very strong we would have years and call. years of phone calls and complaints and problems about the same two dogs. Doesn't that warrant, doesn't that give you the right to get a search okay. warrant and get these dogs out of our neighborhood? It, it, it possibly could. I, I can't give you a, de a definitive yes or no, you know, but this is why this is important. This, this is why, yes. So what, I never so much what I would like, ma'am, the, okay, the, um, I, I don't have an answer for you as to why the property inspection wasn't done, if it was done regarding the two gamblers that were out. Um, but I'm going to talk to Karen about that to find out what officer was involved and why it wasn't done. Because uh, the critical case, we have more power to hold dogs for investigations, okay? That particular case at that time, those dogs, they weren't uh, like a red flag dogs. They were just dogs that were out loose. There were no notes on the call stating that the dogs had behaved aggressively. Uh, it said it was had the property owner from ingress and leaving his property. It would not, the dogs would not allow the owner. Right, okay. The property owner to leave and his that, house. And that was right. written where? I, I, I'm looking at the notes. The officer that went out on the call did not place notes on the call. We live and die by documentation, at least my team does. And, and if the officer, can I finish, please? The, that was deal with it. Exactly, you guys are standing up here and you're receptive, but the deputies and the animal control people come out here all the time, and if they clear the call, UTL, unable to locate. They're gone to the next call because they got 20 waiting. Right. And then when we get together like this and an incident occurs, you've got documentation and you've got documentation of 75 calls, of which 73 of them say UTL. <laughs> Unable to locate, gone. No, no mention. The officer stood in the driveway and said, oh yeah, I know these dogs. They contain it. But, but that officer didn't take the time to put that on there. No, he did not. But he told us. Right. And that doesn't do two, one, two is a me classic. any good when I'm trying to make a case to keep these dogs on the shelf. You're only as good as what you're told and right. what gets to your desk. And that and we that's have to the fix. issue. That we, have to, we have to fix. fix. Mm -hmm. And I'm an animal control officer or a deputy sheriff, and I'm chasing the MT, MDT, or I'm chasing my call law, mm -hmm. and I got 20 calls waiting for me. Guess what I'm putting on there? UTF. And off to the next one. And you never know it. And then you get people in here like this. Well, you know, if we can get this together, and we can do sweeps, and we can saturate, and we can do all this stuff. And coming from Cascade compared to coming from Lancaster, does that mean in the morning Cascade comes and the evening Lancaster comes? I mean, think of that analogy. I'm just talking about traffic, sir. I'm I, that's what I'm talking about. But that's what you're saying. That's what you're trying to tell us. In the morning, they got to come off of it, and in the evening, they got to come off of it. The two dogs, why, why just, you I want to answer it, your second it's part of her question. Why, why, why don't you have an escalating kind of procedure that if there are repeated calls like that, you go to take something active action? Yeah. We do, I do deal with prior history. Internal control of what's okay. going on. Okay. Seven, five years, seven, five complaints, and you've done nothing. Yeah. You're coming here, you knew that you're going to be questions and all this kind of stuff, and you're not prepared to answer that or have any kind of solution, that's understandable. If I knew that she was gonna ask a question about dogs that have been loose for five years, I would have prepared and looked it up. But, but you were not prepared to, and then you didn't ask. We didn't, we didn't have, we had one prior call on those dogs. One prior call, they were at large so, and they were impounded. But what the call? Yes, sir. I'm talking about two others. Okay, if I would, if you can give me that address, I will certainly look it up to see the history and get an answer for you as to why it took that long. Yes, sir. Just a question for some information. If you have a, a situation where you have a second call on a dog, uh, one you trapped the neighbor, the other one attacked the, the neighbor and killed her dog, you take their dogs away from them and you end up putting them down. 
Now, do you, is there any rule that you will not allow those people to have another dog? What would stop them yep. from going out and buying two more large dogs yep. and, put, and putting us in the same situation a week later? Uh, well, that would be if we were to file with the district attorney and request well, not that, that they not the, the, allowed to be to own right. or possess a dog for a period of three years. If I commit a crime with a gun, right. I, I, I can never own a gun. If you commit, right. if you're it's, a dog fighting someone, you can't you never be able to own a dog. Well, well. <laughs> well, yeah, I understand what you're saying, sir. And you know, um, if if we, if we were to go through the DA route and they're mandated, you know, to not own animals. <laughs> That's a lot easier than us just telling them because as you may well know, we can tell them, hey, you're not allowed to own a dog. They'll go on the internet and they'll buy another one and then we end up finding out either later through complaints. You know, proactively it's very hard to, to manage unless we have that stipulated order from the court where they're saying, hey, you cannot own any dogs. They're subject to search and seizure from animal control or, or, or but, any, a law but enforcement. But you are an animal control officer. You've given them a command. They cannot have a dog. You, you go back out because the neighbor complained. They went and got two more large German shepherds. Can't you find them? Can't you have the uh, arrest them? There's got to be some procedure you follow. They don't follow. Because then why would I listen to you? If they've already been deemed vicious or dangerous, yes, we can do something. Yeah. If they're just running or loose, we have to go through a hearing process administratively. But if or you have a dangerous situation, you get rid of the dogs, you right. euthanize them, right. and then they go off by two more. And we're back. Then it them. sounds like, yeah. Right. And then once we know about those dogs, then we'll jump right on. So <laughs> then she gets bit again. She loses we're them. hoping that nobody gets bit. I mean, I can't control somebody yeah. obtaining dogs, but we want to make sure that we monitor if we have priors. It's, it's a miracle. Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah. What a big I mean, I'm talking yeah. 1,000, 2,000, you know, more. Like, what's the route to get that improved? Let's improve, improve, I mean, by more stringent penalties. I'm telling you, I'm not kidding about them going to clean penalties. Let them, let them scoop up dog poop all day long as a community service what? thing. I might think it's funny. I don't. I think, hey, you know, we have trustees washing cars and clearing weeds, and they're manually doing work to try to say, hey, you know, we need to, you know, better ourselves. Sure. So, um, what route do we take? Is it an animal control piece? Is it the county supervisors? Who who creates these laws or rules or the title tens or the whatever? Who is in charge of making those? In case there's some recommendations that we can send to get some more stiffer penalties. Because if we can increase the penalty, perhaps it'll, you know, you're not gonna solve that 100 percent Not everybody follows the rules. But if it makes it more stringent, maybe we can so what route? Who's in charge of all those rules? I would start with your Board of Supervisors, County Council, because I can tell you from my standpoint, it's extremely frustrating because the way Title 10 is written, our hands are pretty much tied when it comes to administratively regulating the owners. We can only administratively regulate the dogs by making sure that they get training, making sure the owners get um, additional property insurance. You know, I mean, there's, there's things that we can do to make sure that the dogs are taken care of and controlled. But when it comes to like pressing charges against somebody who perpetually, you know, goes and gets dogs and lets them run loose. Um, yeah, my unit right now and the way Title 10 is written so, so what you, changes do you want us to ask for? That, that we can administratively regulate and not have to go through the district attorney. Admitted, okay, give me the exact words, because we can... I think just to make it easy on everybody, if, if we could just reach out um, to our uh, your board representative and ask her, hey, can we look at stiffening up the penalties right. For, for these, um, what they'll do is they'll come to us and they'll ask us for our recommendation, and then we can say, hey, stiffer penalty, uh, it could be, you know, uh, higher fines, uh, the ability to regulate uh, the person, not the dog. Chapter 1037. You know. What is it? Chapter um, 1037. So one of the ways this community reaches out to their board of supervisors is through this town okay. council. So I think so Jackie that's has, what I'm a, asking. Yeah, that's that's what a good she's point. Asking. We can start that conversation. You can we, ask, yeah. but we can ask too, and then we both agree. And we, we have asked, because like I said, it is from our standpoint, it, you know, our team, our hands are tied in a lot of circumstances. 
So it's stiff for penalties yes, and administratively sir. regulate the, the dog owners. The dog owners, okay. Well, yes, this only goes on the animal. Hold on, hold on. And you're talking about administrative uh, punishments, the ones that the department itself could, could uh, Issue. impose without going to court. Do they be subject to a hearing officer? Yes. Or yes. People yes. Could, and so in case you didn't care, this is what Palmdale does with fireworks violations because it's such an expensive and time consuming thing to take people to court where the judge is, reduces the punishment anyway. Palmdale instituted administrative penalties uh, that can be appealed to a hearing officer on fireworks uh, violators inside city limits. So that's what they do. I did talk to them because I'm trying to do, do something about fireworks. Um, I did talk to them and they said most of their administrative penalties are appealed to the Superior Court and the Superior, the judges usually knock down the fines because they're so high and the guy says, well, gee, I'm only making, you know, $11 an hour and I'm supporting four kids and I can't afford to pay all this and you know, my kids are going to go hungry. So, I just, there's no, there's no magic bullet for Are these but. hearings um, noticed so that people who want, people who have I, had I know, family just, members they're injured? Not a court, they're not a court hearing, they're, I think it's a referee? Court. What is it, a commissioner? Yeah, but but they wouldn't be when they get kicked up and they appeal it, no? Yeah, yes. all be public. So how, so, so. But again, if, I'm if, saying, this was, this was fireworks, you know. No, no. Nobody's going to show up and say. That's true, yeah. but, but, but it's a process that. If somebody does appeal it and goes to Superior Court, it would be certainly Animal Care and Control will know about it. And, right. and if we have a Title 10 written up to notify the community, we would take the entire case file would. and, you know, the, like the PDD case file, the prior history, right. and everything would be presented before the judge. And hopefully, stakeholders, such as people who've been injured, will be told about it too, so they can. Be One of those, the other things that I would like to see things out there. Um, other agencies, we don't do it currently, uh, but to license a potentially dangerous or vicious dog with restriction, um, I would like to see an increase in so cost special licenses. Yeah, special, special licensing, licensing yeah. Yeah. up so, to three hundred dollars a year. So this is I'm gonna direct this kind of to both groups, but what as uh, someone let's say I am out and a dog starts to attack my kid, what Sure. Um, I, I, I am yes. I am allowed to do that. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. You can protect your property too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. One hundred percent. Does the dog have any bite or just the fact it's going to bite? Yeah, if you feel fear for your, your life yeah. or you feel threatened, it's a bite or animal. Or, or, or your animal, but it's your animal. animal. Yes, yeah. your yeah. animal too, especially yeah. livestock. If it's your livelihood, you have a right to protect it. Thank you. Open yourself up to this possibility. I was going to ask the same question. What happens if? You know, if somebody's being attacked and you, you know it looks kind of really bad, you can shoot the dog or whatever. Now the line, bear, yeah. whatever. We help them all. <coughs> what could you do if I see someone being attacked? How can I help try to stop the attack if I don't have a weapon? Call nine one one. Garden hose with a garden hose, some type of spray, making noise. I mean, throwing. Sometimes the place will be around now and one to get not only us but to get fire rescue responding is critical because you don't know where they might be injured, where they you know, bleed out or something like that. So sometimes you're just walking along and a dog comes on beach and what do we do? I would say first and, and foremost, when we give trainings uh, to children to constantly be aware of your surroundings. After working in this unit for close to eight years, I don't want my dog in my neighborhood um, because at any given time, something could happen. When I decide to walk my dog, I carry a mag light with me. Um, a baseball bat is a little too. <laughs> well, you, you doesn't look good, but you, you, you have to be prepared. Yeah. Especially out here, you know, like with, with wildlife, you know, coyotes. Be cognizant of your surroundings. Let somebody know that you're leaving. Go in pairs. Um, you want to be yeah. careful that if you're seeing something, you don't want to fall victim to that either. Absolutely. So right. Well, and I think that's why this particular situation on March six was so disturbing. Because it was a foot outside of my parents' house. This was not, they live on two and a half acres. Right. The house is set all the way in the back. 
and her dog was on a leash. We're not talking about the park. Right. Yeah, you right. do open yourself up. She now has to carry, you know, pepper mm -hmm. spray. She's going to get in a taser. Thank you, Women's Club. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, that's what the disturbing part of this right. was. It wasn't a passerby. Yes, you take it into your own hands when you're on the road, walking but in a park, at a dog park, whatever. Those are inherent risks. But to just walk outside and let your dog go to the bathroom at 7 a.m. in the morning is not a typical thing. And I was in no. Phoenix, so yeah. we wouldn't have needed any of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then to find out what went on on the 911 and your tape call sheriffs and sheriff referring, now you can see why I'm sitting here in the attitude I have. Yeah. Unfortunate. Clarify. Render the situation safe. <laughs> Can I clarify one thing in this case where Charlene's mom was attacked? If I understand this correctly, through all the banter back and forth, that you folks did come out and pick up those two dogs, the two gamblers, right? And they were never returned to the owner. They were euthanized by you. Yes, correct. And what action was taken against the owner thus far? At this time, nothing. Nothing, nothing yet, no. nothing yet. Nothing yet. Is it too late to take action? No. No. We have a year. We have a year. So Thank what, um, what if, if the people who were affected by this directly mm -hmm. would like you to take action, what would you recommend to them to do to see if they can get you to do that? Well, we have well, I think I think she already I think she already expressed, you know, her interest. Okay. Like I said, this is why I said, you know, we, we need to review it. Um, possibly take it to the DA. Hopefully they'll take the case. Uh, if that, then that's when the owner will be uh, held accountable criminal to the court, criminal. So could you give them your letter to have that? That might help convince the DA. I mean, whatever, to make yeah. the DA Absolutely. say yes. Mm -hmm. You can yeah, forward it, you can, do you have my email address? If you I don't, have I have email. my I have cards here. If anybody has any questions or anything, you can follow up with me on any of it. Mm -hmm. Because well, my team would be the one that would File the case with the district attorney. Yes. We we live in a close knit community, and the fact that when we heard about the dog, it was disturbing to us because we've seen dogs in our neighbor. We live up on a hill far away, supposedly, and these dogs appear that we have no idea who they belong to. When we heard about that, we had we knew that it had to have been the same two dogs that we had seen. But by the time we go out to find them, they're gone. We don't know where they go. But <coughs> it is disturbing to know that it took them so long to get a resolution. And it would be really nice if they could find a way to connect the two agencies so that when things like this happen in rural Acton, which is where we live, we get a quicker response than what they did. Because it does affect all of us. I was afraid to go outside when I heard about the dog because it could eat me in one bite. It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> They're so big. They're huge. They're huge, huge. dogs. So, well, we're, so we're, we're open to uh, work with, with the captain here and, and see what we can work out how to improve our communications and our response. Yeah, we're we're right. open to that. And if we have to write a letter as a community, that would be something Anthony and I will definitely go We'll do whatever we need to do to make this happen. Not just, especially with Karen and, and losing her puppy. That's so unnecessary. Mm -hmm. It's so sad. We don't want this to happen to anybody. We don't want it to happen. It shouldn't yeah. yeah. happen at all. Mm -hmm. Well, I take it that most of the time, dogs. Some dogs are inherently aggressive, but I think it's the owners and how the owners treat those dogs, mm -hmm. how they raise them. Yeah. Necessarily. What they do with those dogs. I mean, it does. It does um, have something to do with it. But some breeds of dogs are more predisposed to certain um, certain behaviors and tendencies than owners. Well, these were bred to like when we did our yeah gamblers. They're bred to take down bears. Right. Okay. To protect yeah. sheep yeah. and livestock. Right. Yeah. yeah. Their livestock guardians. They're bred to take down bears or any so, type of predator that's their instinct. <coughs> I, I am against free profiles because I still think a chihuahua right. can still really bite you and do, right. you know, obviously they can't right. kill you, yeah. but yeah. 
Do you know what I'm saying? All dogs have a propensity for yes, bite. Yes, that's true. But some are obviously. And some bite differently. Correct. A German Shepherd bites completely differently than a Queensland healer who bites differently than Correct. a pit bull. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Just for information, I was a breeder for 25 years of German Shepherd dogs. My dogs were never aggressive because we trained them with manners. I could take these dogs anywhere, show them all over the country. So the German Shepherds, yes, they can be pretty nasty, but with the owners, if you take the time to teach them proper manners, you don't have any problems. Which is why they should yeah. be held responsible. Yeah. That's they right, I was responsible them. for, I don't know how many letters, and my dogs were shown all over, never had a problem. It just right. seems like such a waste. With these particular dogs and the description of the attack, I don't see that there would have been any other recourse than to put them down. A dog that will run from the front door to the back door to continue to, everybody, that's not normal behavior. A lot of times people will, um, they'll wait until the PDD or vicious hearing is complete before they file civilly so that they have our documentation on the dog when they have the dog. All right. Okay. Any other unanswered questions? If, um, just so I'm clear, can I, um, as far as moving forward with filing, is that something you're going to look into? Or yes, absolutely. We'll we may have to get in touch with you again just to get some more <coughs> some more uh, details hammered down. Do you folks yes, have okay. cards that you can Yes, yes, I'll give you a card. I just have one final thing I wanted to check out. They talked about the horse that was attacked, the two riders, how the dog mm -hmm. got out of the gate, and we were out of the country when that happened, and it goes to the call to tell us, oh my God, look, this happened, blah, blah, blah. So to Say that nothing really happened because the horse didn't get medical treatment is the tiniest part of a huge problem. If you're on the back of a horse and you're being attacked by a German Shepherd or any right. dog, we have Shepherds, so I'm not, yeah. you know, right. any yeah. big dog, the horse is rearing, bucking, playing, right. and next thing you know, you're going to be being drugged by a stirrup or thrown off the horse, and the dog, the horse getting bit is the least of your worries. Your, your fear is. Right. Your horse is now afraid of dogs for the next five years, and you're potentially going to end up with a broken neck. Right. So, so, well, I mean, if I if I came across that way, I yeah. didn't mean to oh. say that it wasn't it wasn't anything. I mean, no. I mean, yeah. each each case that comes across our desk, like I said, we have to look at it as it could potentially end up in superior court. Most right. of our some of our cases do, um, and to move forward. I want a bulletproof case because I have to. I have to think of like what questions are they going to ask. Right. If a, if an owner says, "Oh, you know, it's just a scratch. I don't want to go to the vet," that's one hole that the defense is going to find. And except for the case of horses, it's a different level of right, right. Scary. So, so please, I guess it's that, I'm glad you made yeah. that point, Jake, because it's really important. Somehow we have to convince your. We're not discounting it. Right, no, 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 we're, no not, we're not saying you won't, but... Yeah, we're, we're, we, did, we will go out and investigate No, I, I don't mean to say you're discounting it, but I, I guess I'm asking you to raise it to the height that it should have. It's not the same as, 
as, mm -hmm. you know. It's driven by the community, though. The person that was attacked, they have to come forward and say, I want to go to a hearing, I want to pursue this. Well, that's and if good they don't want to pursue anything, well, well, and they want to work it out, there's not a lot we can do sometimes. I think we have a question, Karen. I guess, yeah. Here, if I can make a, a quick suggestion, sure. is there a way that you can get someone in your office to follow up on these calls? Because the people who call had this emergency happen to them, and, and the enforcement did, and they came out, and they weren't seriously hurt. They don't know all the rules or what the requirements are, and mm -hmm. but if you can have someone follow up and say um, what we, what, you know. This is what we need, or. Right, this is how, this is how. You should give the okay. information to the people and tell them, you know, sometimes, uh, I work for labor relations and so forth, I'd have to tell you, I can't do anything unless I can get a written statement from you because they have protection. Or they need, you need to follow up with the person and go, hey, okay, we got this call a couple days ago, we're just following up, are you okay? Mm -hmm. that, I just want to give you your options, what you can do in the future, and explain to them why they need to follow through. When they don't hear from you, their horse is not badly damaged, they go on with life, and, and this dog goes on to attack someone else. Yeah, we'll have I think that's a point well taken, it's up. understood. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can, that's something we can look at, for sure. Yes, ma'am. Is there any way that you can coordinate, because you are stressed so thin with the Cascade and I guess it would be Lancaster or Palmdale, because of the, the traffic patterns mm -hmm. that, you know, during a certain time, your response is definitely going to be quicker one way versus the other. Is there any way that That's you, something we you can guys look at. can coordinate to say, sure. hey, these are the high traffic times, it's going to take us two hours, where you guys might be able to respond in 45 minutes so. and maybe... Yes, understood. Well, um, we have a communication center and dispatch center in, in Lancaster. Um, I think it's something that's uh, uh, worth talking to the uh, communication center up north. Um, they're the ones that are monitoring where, which unit is where, and maybe we can look at, you know, maybe interfering. You know, if there's a unit that's closer, that's up in Palmdale, uh, and, and these guys are down in San Fernando or whatever. That's something worth exploring for because sure. Because really, it would help you guys too, because. You're wasting all of your time just in travel time. Not when I say wasting, but you know, burning it. And with, I, I know it's just it's unfathomable that there's so little of you know staff. And you know, and then it really would be training for the communications because you know the staff isn't generally or may not necessarily know where people are. Yeah, we can you can save a lot of time, and you can increase your response time. Sure. Yeah. Are you, you know, and are maybe you fully staff? Is that eight being fully staffed, or do you have vacancies, or? Uh, so our officer uh, rate, according to the uh, National Animal Control uh, Association, uh, we are at a 71% understaffed level. So a <laughs> quicker approach may be to ask for more staffing. <laughs> If a little bit cheaper than building a building and stuff like that, and then you can allocate some staffing. Possibly you guys are like more dispatch too. Why do you need two separate dispatches? You know. Well, we only have no, one for the animal building. Well, there was only one dispatch center. For the animal building. Yes. Because our issue, we, we face a staff issue. The one that part of the animal, the one that the dispatch. Oh, okay. yeah, sort of There's there. a south that's like Downey and Carson and all those. Right, and if you need to, if you have to look into maybe getting, you know, an app or have something for communication to actually see, well, where are my units? Right, that's what that's what I'm saying. Based on coordinating the, the units and where they're at. At that particular time of the time of the call. Yep. You know, this is going to be the one that can respond quickly. Understood. Yep. How many calls do you get on average per day where you actually have to go out and, and send a, an officer? It really depends. Um, it just talking, changes so often. Right, but are we just a range? Are we talking about you ever have days when there's no calls? No. no. <laughs> there's always calls. <laughs> <laughs> never have a day when no I worked at the Castaic well. office, when I worked out of Castaic, when I would leave, with calls, I would leave with approximately 10 to 15 calls in my box. These were calls that you know, I either had to follow up on or they were placed in a box before I, before I went out. And while I was out on the road, I could be dispatched another 15. I worked swing, so I worked from Gorman to Acton by myself um, with probably 30 calls in my box. 
Well, if so that it's, situation it's, continues, which I trust it will unless yeah. something's done, there is no way in the world you'll be able to service any area fairly. I mean, you just can't. There's not enough. Well, we go by priority. Well, we, said we, we handle the calls by priority. So what's the priority? That's, so what's that's, the priority? that's how we, that's how we triage are first. the calls. Okay. Um, and then public safety is next. And then we got a lot of rattlesnakes coming in right now. Yeah, this time of year. Wait, 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 wait. Injured animals are before public safety? No. Public well, no. No, they're all the same. Injured animals are before public safety. They're all, they're all, they're all, they're all, they're all in the same category. A priority oh, okay. yeah, call priority one. consists okay. of uh, uh, everything you said, including um, rattlesnakes right now as the season is getting hotter. Yes, yes ma'am. And, and on that description, you just came out the box with 15 and received 15 during your eight hour shift. Yes. How many did you never get to on average? Um, I would say probably a good 10. 10. So 10 people who called never saw you. It would depend on the type of call. Let's I would call have, it eight. I would have to prioritize. If it was a 974, which is a dog roaming at large, nope. I could do a sweep, go through. And that's to answer your question earlier about doing sweeps. You guys are only as good as the information to get to you. And let's call it seven calls. Seven people in this room call and never get seen. <coughs> Um, occasionally, to uh, I, I did print out something that uh, Danny did approve that I could pass out to everybody. Um, just different tips when you call and you're speaking to the dispatcher. Um, the type of information you give to the dispatcher is extremely important and can be very helpful to the officer. Um, we get a lot of anonymous calls where people don't want to leave their name, but I just saw this. Uh, but I don't want to give you my name or my phone number. Okay, who do we contact? But that's a call, and we have to respond to that address. So I, I'll or pass these number. out. Right. So you um, can only do so much in an eight-hour shift. Right. Right. But I mean, the, the people that are here are concerned, and you can make copies of these. You can pass them we'll, around. We'll to have neighbors. these uh, in the back, so you guys can. Talk I'm to telling your dispatch is good. They ask, I mean, they ask 20 questions. Right. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. I just want to clarify something. You have a central dispatch sure. that will handle calls out to the different areas? So we have, we have two. We have one in Downey that will service all the southern uh, uh, Valley County, and then we have the northern <coughs> communication center. So when we call up here, you're calling the, the this only goes to Cascade, right? No, when you're, when you're, if you're calling us up here, the call goes to the communication center that's located at the Lancaster Animal Care Center. Okay. Unless it's at midnight. From there, they have to dispatch it from Cascade. Yes. That's yes. the way it is now. True. Yes. But as a, to her point, right. you know, that's why it's important to meet with the folks up there. And you know, by that's looking at who's where, right. uh, if we could coordinate the response a lot that better, be then, then I mean, it's definitely worth, think, worth looking into. into. Yeah. So, Chuck? I think we need to really bring up that the resources aren't being allocated here. And Jeremiah just brought up the point is the county just, you know, approved the Centennial Project. It's in, it's in works. How are you going to, you know, there's a whole other area that's going to get developed with animals that that's, significant that's going to add to your area of operations. 20,000 so, really? homes is a more tax understand. And there you go, that too. Yeah. They're, they're supposed to be, I think they're supposed to be building a sheriff's station out there because that will be a big place with. right we have to compete with departments that now have mandates for example we have the homeless initiative you know wait wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry you just said you're 71% understaffed yes. I reject any statement that is we are so understaffed we're not even as normal as anyone else 71% understaffed and the reason for that being financing 
That's not acceptable. If you want to go more no, than what's he's average. Not, he's not. No, no, no. No, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that, that Europe being 71% understaffed it's not okay. cannot be because it's taxes. Because if you want to be more than normally overstaffed, that might be impeded because of taxes. But you should have 100% staff. Paris is what I'm trying to say. And that, that staffing ratio is, is under the judgment of animal control officers. If you ask Across the country. Running a newspaper, did I have enough reporters? No, I needed yeah. more reporters. Everybody yeah, knows. But I think, I think what we're saying is we're, yeah. we're, we're citing the fact that we have a lot of people saying that yeah, we are. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, so I said three yeah. hours to get out here. Correct. Yes. And so I think that's what our, our yeah. I think what we're going to take from this is probably wanting to write a letter to say, hey, we're, we, think we need we, more stuff out yes, here. Yes, we need more stuff out here. three hours to get from Castilla. Yes, and, and we're dealing with life and death things uh, yeah. for people, livestock, Etc. And that's not okay. Uh, and what can we do? And I'm just, I'm just giving you a little bit of the dynamics that we have to face when we're going to, you know, <coughs> thinking for budget allocations. You know, we do have to compete with, you know, departments. We're saying we want to help you compete. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm just saying taxes can't be the reason why you're understaffed. So it's frustrating as a supervisor to not have the personnel to go and handle Absolutely. the Absolutely. Yeah. the community. It's frustrating if you have more people, you can stage yeah. them. No, so yeah, we get it. Yeah. And so what we're saying agree. is we, wanna, we want to we want to make sure we're pulling yeah. the right levers to try to make that happen. And except you guys too is, is trying to, you know, which we've had lots of conversations about this, just trying to get more coverage for here. And, and it is unique. So while yes, per capita, it, yeah, on, on street, you know, those numbers, but that's not it's not one dimensional. People don't have scampers in the middle of LA. <laughs> they might. They might. Uh, they actually, yes, they do. Actually, yeah. we do. We and start they're, they're becoming more popular, unfortunately. Yeah. Caucasian mountain dogs, gampers. We're getting a whole gamut of these large dogs from, and not all of them are aggressive, but the ones that are, it's it's terrible because yeah, they're big dogs. We took from Green Valley. We took about ten big Caucasian Shepherd type dogs. Yeah, but that's not down to LA or the departments, is what it. No, but they, they have them there though. I've I've, I've gone on calls from the city of LA on these big Caucasian dogs. And the volume down there is. It's, I mean, it's, it's Crazy. No, I, this is probably not, but it, right. to act in area, um, no, I was just going to say, it's two years. Because I'm saying maybe that's a resource wise, like if they get a call, they can say, hey, we're on our way, but in the meantime, here's a guy who wants rattlesnakes. So Actually, I think there's two guys. Give him a drop hand on him, and he may take the problem for you to get out there. I'm just saying to help you guys out. There's a guy around town that, that he wants rent. No. Well, is he licensed? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's another uh, Mr. Fruit? Yeah. 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 And it's usually the fire department will respond, but that's not really their call or out of state. You know? Yeah, you can get, but they did there, come there is, yeah. They have come out. There's a, lot a, um, there's a rattlesnake handler. For the Acton and Alabama area, I met him. He actually has a really, really fast response time. I have his number in my car. Um, and it's two guys. Uh, one handles you guys at Acton, one handles Alabama He does it humanely. He catches them and then he releases them out. Of so my, 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 my thing was: is is there any way they can advise somebody that even though we're on, we're going to come out, but in the meantime. In your area, there is a person. So I have actually given that number to our desk personnel. Right, that can animal control you because they're get, they're going to they're fielding all yeah. the calls. Or a Generally lot of calls speaking, we actually yeah. receive the calls first, okay. and then we 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 get we distribute to fire, we distribute to animal control. So the sheriff's department is usually your primary contact, unless you call them directly. If you're calling nine one one, you're getting the Palmdale Sheriff Station to be called from Acton. Yeah. Right? Anytime you call nine one one out here, okay. the only Sometimes you'll get CHP if you're calling from a cell phone and it bounces off the, the towers a different way, you'll get CHP. But other than that, you're going to get Palmdale Sheriff Station, we're going to notify Animal Control. And like I, I put out an email to them and I've instructed them with, hey, I found this guy, he's quick, he comes out really you know, quick, he does it humanely. So. Okay, uh, one, one more and then we're going to wrap it up because. Oh, go ahead. And you've been ask, on everybody that was asking about the loose dogs and we don't see them when they're loose. Would they videotape those dogs roaming around? That would, be that, help? that would be helpful. That would be helpful. Or pictures. As long as it's done safely, do not put yourself in danger to take a photograph of a dog. 
Um, if you can, you know, use your phone through your house or security footage. Everybody has I, security footage. I'm your car. I photograph them, and videotape them, and by the time your animal control officer gets out three hours later, they, hey, I have to see, I have to catch them. I, I got a tape right here, right in the middle of my goat pen. Hey, sorry. Don't take you. UTL. I'm able to locate. But if we have that address, we will contact the owner. I know. But, but, but see what so the address is as good as what gets to you. And you talk this talk about photos, and it goes both ways. The sheriff's department as well. I mean, I got a video of the neighbor strangling my wife, and the deputy didn't want the tape. <laughs> Think about that. Uh -oh. Finally, a sergeant had to come out and then have another deputy come take the report. We That's a whole other issue. We have hundreds of pictures. We have videotapes of dogs mm -hmm. loose in our area. It didn't do any good. Who did you get them to? I they don't want them. They don't want them. I've given them to other people. I've given them to the sheriff's department. Ask for a supervisor. Ask for me. And I yeah, will. It's too late. late. Yeah, it's okay. too late. It's well, never too late. It's never too late. I mean, this might happen. You're saying because the dogs have a hard knock there anymore. Go ahead and right. In the future. I mean, we're here to try to correct the problems. We do. Well, it's, you can send it's it. It's very frustrating. We do have the evidence. Okay, well, moving asking. forward, moving forward, I'm going to give you my card. All right. You know Karen. I'll give you my card. If too, you have please. an officer that comes out to your area and you are not satisfied, get her name and badge number and right. call Karen. Or call know. myself. Because we can't fix the, the problem time. if we don't know <laughs> where the problem is. Yeah, okay, yeah, very much. Go ahead. I just want to say thank you for everybody coming to help support us. Um, and I hope that through all of this, something will be done, because especially for the owners, that was our frustration in knowing that these dogs have been out multiple times. And so that's really our purpose, to make the owners accountable for their dogs. I'm not against them having dogs, but make them accountable. Something needs to be done. So your job is easier in the end because if people are accountable for their dogs through legislation or whatever it takes, your job will be easier in the end too. But I want to thank everybody for coming and helping. I just want to add that real quickly. A lot of times you look at what cities do, incorporated cities, and you'll see that they've really taken some of this stuff seriously, and not just dogs, but all kinds of violations in the city where the county does not have the same standards. So when the county needs to look to enforce something, maybe we should look at some of our cities, incorporated cities, and see how they handle it. It can give us a lot of good ideas. All right, well, thank you. Thank you guys for coming up. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So I'd like to make a motion that we ask sure. The county. You want to pass these out? I'm going to make a motion. We ask the county to lodge your title to 